Hey everybody, this is David Paul, the host of the Capital Stack Podcast, where I talk to founders, entrepreneurs, and investors about all things value creation in startups. Today, I am talking to my man, Les Craig. Les, what's going on? You know, it's a it's a beautiful fall day in Bozeman. Nice and nice and chilly, a brisk forty five, while I think other parts of the country are baking away. So I'm I'm happy. Life is good. Yeah, it's changed a lot the weather uh, back and forth here. Yeah, it has. You know, I I uh, yeah. What's it like? What's it like uh, where you are today? Humid. Yeah. You know, sticky and humid. Are you a climate change denier? Uh, I I. I play one on TV sometimes, but uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's like, uh, I, I think it's like, it's one of those things. It's like too soon to tell. I mean, yeah. I don't know. It, by, <laughs> by the time, by the time we know it'll be too late. So I, yeah, I, I buy, I buy it all. Yeah. I'm not much of a politico, but it just seems like there's so much, um, there's so much better things to argue about than climate change. It's like, I mean, is littering bad? Like, can we just like all agree that we shouldn't litter? <laughs> exactly. Well, and that's the thing too. It's like, I, I think like we can all do our part to, uh, you know, to quote unquote, save the planet, so to speak. It's like, just do, do the right thing. Do things that are moral, ethical, make sense, reasonable. Like, is that so hard? <laughs> yeah, don't As opposed be to being extreme about things, you know? Yeah, well, that's just yeah. too rational, man. You yeah. can't be. You have to. You, you have to pick a side. Got to be polarized here. Yeah, it's <laughs> you America. Be polarized. It's America. You got to be America. one end or the other. Exactly. So, Les, tell us your backstory. What are you drinking? Uh, I it maybe it might look like an IPA, but it is uh, noon in Bozeman, so this is a hop water. Okay. Sponsored. So you're, so you're this episode drinking. sponsored by. It's great. <laughs> so you, uh, it's, yeah. It's so you're, great... you're day drinking. That's cool. And, uh... <laughs> In Montana. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. My story. Uh, how did I get here? Uh, wow. That's a. That's a. That could be the whole episode. But I'll give you the short. Short version. Uh, or do you want the long version? You whatever you want. All right. Short version. So I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, I kind of my ticket out of Erie was the military. So I went to West Point. Um, was a, a commissioned army officer in two thousand three. Uh, spent the next kind of 30 months of five years on active duty, deployed, uh, was a ranger platoon leader, special operations guy, um, got a little frustrated with uh, how the military was using data to make decisions. So I got out and I got a job working, building product for the, uh, for the Army um, as, a, as a contractor through Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Labs. We built some really cool math models, uh, some, some products to help battlefield commanders make decisions and got scooped up by the Central Intelligence Agency, not the Culinary Institute of America, although they both have the same acronym, you know, CIA. Um, and I spent three years, uh, three years at the CIA doing fun stuff. Uh, got, you know, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, it's funny, the, the theme of, of your podcast, obviously, like entrepreneurs and founders and, and investors, like that is who I am at my core. Like I've always been, a, been an entrepreneur. Um, and some fun stories there, but uh, I was sort of this entrepreneur that was always trapped in like the ultimate bureauc the most crazy bureaucracies you could imagine, right? Uh, the military academy, the U.S. Army, an academic research institute, uh, and then the CIA. And so finally, my escape out, you know, 20, 2011, I left the agency and I started a cybersecurity company called Red Isle Analytics. Took that company through a couple, uh, you know, with, with my co-founders through a couple series of venture financing, I thought, wow, what a, what a terrible profession that is. Uh, I stay as far away as I can from those people uh, in my future. And um, I tried to- <laughs> Those <them>. people, those <laughs> people. Exactly, we'll get there, we'll go back to that. But, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I basically uh, um, started, I tried to bootstrap a company after that. Um, and then in 2015, uh, as I was just sort of getting kind of my life back on track with my family and, and, and getting getting well, um, I decided to move to uh, to Montana and kind of start start a new chapter. Um, and I ran the Blackstone Launchpad at Montana State University for about three years before getting picked up by my current firm, Next Frontier Capital, which is an early stage venture capital firm focused on providing access to capital to founders in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, and so. 
That journey began in 2017 and uh, joined the firm when we were raising Fund 2, which was a, a $38 million fund, 16 portfolio companies in that fund, and we're currently investing out of Fund 3, which is an $80 million fund, uh, 22 portfolio companies in that, uh, in that, in that fund to date, and we're, we, we're you know, getting ready to raise our next fund. So, Awesome. That's the journey. That's what got me here today, drinking a hop water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, for those who are on a podcast, it's not hop water. He's actually drinking a wine cooler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we used to call those bitch pops in college. Really? Yeah. <laughs> My mom <laughs> like, loves wine coolers. That was always like right? a refrigerator <laughs> growing up, the wine cooler. Yeah, yeah, that's really depressing, but, you know. <laughs> She she loved wine coolers and putting cigarettes out on my arm. Um, <laughs> that is the opposite of my mom, but yeah, I mean, yeah. whatever injury you So, see. West Point, 2003, that was right around, like, that was right around 9-11, wasn't it? When was 9-11? 2001? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Good. so, yeah, yeah so, like, you were... Says, yes. so, yeah, so 2001, because the reason why I know this is because my sister was a, a pointer. She, yeah, so she went that. in, yeah, so I think she graduated in 03. What? Or she started in 03. Yeah, yeah, she, her name was Jen Blatty. She played on the tennis team. Huh. You, you need to look that up, B-L-A-T-T-Y. But she was, right. she was in, in West Point, in or around the time that you were there. That's wild. Uh, it's a tight, mm -hmm. it's a tight network too, so I'll, I'll look it up. But, um, you know, even, even more crazy to the, uh, the 9-11 story for me, um, so I actually, after my sophomore year at West Point, um, this is a fun story that not a lot of people know, but I actually applied for transfer admission to Notre Dame, and I got in. And mm -hmm. I was done. I was leaving the academy. So this was this would have been the spring of 2001. Went to my TAC officer, Captain Crumwitty. Like, you just can't make up a better TAC officer name than that. Uh, he's probably like a general now, so General Crumwitty. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. He told me, he's like, I, I said, sir, I don't want to be in the Army. He said, uh, he said, what, what do you mean? Like, you, you don't even know what the Army is. And I said, sir, I've been at West Point for two years. He said, this is not the Army. He said, if you want to make a decision like that, uh, I, what I, what, the way I will support it is if you go out and serve with a unit this summer in the Army. Think of it as a paid vacation. I'll send you anywhere in the world. And I was like, Okay, if that's all I need to do, sure, I'll take a paid vacation to. I was like, I've never left the country, um, mm -hmm. so I was like, I want to go to, I want to go to Europe. He's like, great, I'll send you to Wiesbaden, Germany. We'll send you to an aviation unit, a Mira Medevac unit. So basically, I spent the entire summer of 2001, hanging out with pilots, flying up and down the Rhine River every day, going to German clubs at night. I was 20 years old. You're right. I, had a <laughs> so I, was I was like, this is the best summer ever. This army thing is cool. <laughs> Yeah. What am I passing up? So I came back. He said, well, what'd you think? I said, sir, I'm staying. I'm in. And when you go to your first day of class, your freshman year at West Point, uh, that's it. Like you're locked into your five years service commitment. So my, this was, I went to my first day of class at West Point late August of 2001. And so like mm -hmm. two or three weeks later, 9-11. 9-11. Yeah. So you, you knew you were yeah. going to war, right? Yeah. I mean... Well, and what's fascinating too is like, I actually didn't go, people are like, oh, you went to West Point, you wanted to be in the army. I actually did not. I did not want to be in the army. I had no call to service. I had, and I'm like, totally, you know, like this is, it is what it is. Uh, I wanted to be a doctor and West Point for this blue collar kid from, you know, West, Northwestern Pennsylvania, like that was the best option for me. I got into mm -hmm. some other great schools, but like there was no money for, for college and, you know, um, so, West Point was the free option for me to become a doctor. I decided I didn't want to be a doctor after you know I took organic chemistry and, and uh, human anatomy and physiology, uh, but I definitely didn't want to be in the army. That's why I wanted to leave. 9-11 for me was the first time in my life I felt that call to service. And I was like, you know what? Now not only do I want to be in the army, but I want to, be, I want to serve this country. I want to go to war. I want to be on the front lines. I want to be an infantry officer. And uh, it, it just was like a complete 180 for me. And I wanted to actually, when I got commissioned, my goal, my plan was I want to be a career officer in the military. That was what I wanted to do. Wow, that's awesome. What a great story. I think a lot of people got very patriotic around 9-11. Yeah. 
um, which they should. Um, same thing with my sister. She went there on a tennis scholarship. She didn't even know what West Point was, right? And someone, yeah, and the, it's actually a very weird story. So she got accepted. She got all the letters of recommendation, and then they send you the slip, like, are you coming, yes or no? And, like, she was like, oh, I don't think I want to do this. My mom signed yes and sent it in. <laughs> <laughs> so I made, the, I made the decision for her. So I I actually wasn't even going to apply to West Point. Similar, it's so funny the way this stuff happens. It's like, it makes me wonder how many cadets actually <laughs> show up. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, I, and then and then nine eleven happens, and she's like, "Okay, what, mom? What happened if she died like overseas, and you were the one that checked the box? Like that would, like yeah. I mean, that, that, I mean yeah. like that. How would you tough. live with yourself for that one? But it's tough. she made. I it. went to I went to a college fair. My mom was like, made me go to this college fair. I'm like, mom, I already got into I I got got into Notre Dame already at the time. This was the first time I got into Notre Dame, and I'm like, I'm dead set. I'm going there. And she's like, just go to the college fair. I'm like, okay. And there was there was a young captain uh attractive young captain running the recruiting table so i had to go over and talk to her and like she sold me on being interested enough to apply um but even even that even though i applied i was still like well i'm not gonna go there you know but then right. i ended up going there and then the rest is yeah history so the rest is history cool and you like women in uniform that's good to know <laughs> so all right real quick because we got to start talking about business at some point oh but... of course CIA, tell us yes. the least, the not classified, but the most secret thing you can say <laughs> as a spy, right? Like what's one thing that you can tell us that like you're not going to get in trouble for, but All like right. is good enough that needs to be, that I can put it on a podcast. That would be something fun. Uh, uh, la, 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 la. Okay, so here's a good one. So everything that you see in the movies is real and okay. i mean this i mean this in a very sincere way however it's only real in the training because the real life job is about the most boring ridiculous bureaucratic thing you could ever imagine and so the training is incredible the training is like straight out of every movie you've ever seen Jason Bourne, nah, you know, whatever. Right. The training is so cool. And I've been to all, I've been to, I, I spent the first year I was there, I missed the class that I was supposed to go in, we'll just call it that. And uh, so I had to take a year, I had to wait till the next running. I had to take a year of like CIA university classes, which is kind of funny. Like there actually is that, they have like this internal thing. So I took like all the training, I took everything once and then i got into my class which was like a whole nother training thing very specific but like i lived the dream for like you know a good almost two years a year and, nine and you were like i'm gonna i'm a spy like when you're doing the training you're like oh, Dude, I, so this is gonna fun. be amazing so yeah and then you're like and then, and then all of a sudden like then you get shoved with paperwork and yeah and then you get shoved into like a basement and with like no windows and you can't like go online you just have to read like the internal stuff all day it's like oh my god this is terrible yeah <laughs> and what'd you do for them like data stuff security stuff uh you know stuff stuff yeah stuff you can't talk about yeah okay it's it's, it's on my uh it's on my yeah just check it out on linkedin <laughs> <laughs> but it sucked yeah yeah okay. i mean you know look I, here's the thing i will say this because i i i don't want to just i don't want to you know say it's it's a terrible place it's a it's an amazing place filled with unbelievable people who are dedicated to service and the mission the mission is incredible it's like no other the work is hard and it's boring and it's um it's it's tough work but if you love the mission and you support the mission yeah there's people that have amazing careers there and, and do you know they're the they're the people that get no no thanks while we're sleeping they keep us safe i mean very similar calling as the military but they get even less credit probably i would say so yeah so you were a technical field engineer whatever that means very good. Oh, you have good you have <laughs> Google skills. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, there right. it is. Well, you nailed whatever, it. Whatever Technical. that means. You're a tech. Yeah. <laughs> Technical field engineer. Super cool. All right. <laughs> Up next. So, thirty-five million dollar fund. I don't want to talk about your 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 startup. Oh, wait, no, I do want to talk about your startup. VCs okay. suck. Let's go into that. 
Yeah. So you know, I I uh, I think the challenge, like when I the first the first rodeo of of going through venture capital, you know, I, I had a great you know two great co-founders. One of them had been through a successful um, kind of multiple successes of starting companies, but all bootstrapped and mostly in the government kind of contracting space. So for the three of us, this was the first time ever going after and raising venture capital. And the challenge I think for that is, and like like my best advice, um, and you know, there's like there's a there's a crass analogy related to this that I'm not going to say, but it's like if you want to if you want to do this, if you want to do it, do it with somebody that has done it before. That is that is like the way you successfully, you know, I th I think as a first time founder, and it doesn't necessarily need to be like do it with a co-founder that's done it before. It could be. You know, just like have an advisor, have an investor, like a, your first investor, be somebody that knows the game. Because there's so much that you can, you can sort of artificially screw, just screw up out of the gate that is going to lead to uh, just just more follow on, not bad decisions, but just circumstances where you get deleveraged and further deleveraged. And like by the time I left our I left our company just without the detail, because I, I don't, you know, it's 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 kind of a it's a personal experience and it's a co-founder experience that like there's there's stuff there um, that you know I don't I don't share with really anybody um, but just to say like I left the company after our series a uh, the company went on to raise a series B and then and then subsequently got acquired by force point with which is a Raytheon subsidiary after a series B you know but for me as a founder looking at where I was based on ownership after the series a looking at where the company was looking at the progress the milestones and then the personal sacrifices that I made, living in Baltimore, you know, trying to send my kids to private schools because, you know, the public schools just were not really an option from my perspective. So it's like there were personal situation and circumstance that created challenges. There was cap table situation that created challenges. Um, it was it was it was a really exhausting run and just burned mm -hmm. burned me out. And when I look back at it and I think about. I mean, we created, I'm proud. The one thing I'm most proud of is like, we created a category in cyber, UE, the UEBA category, user and entity behavioral analytics. We created that category and uh, we should, we could have, I shouldn't say we should have, we could have been a billion dollar company. I'm, I'm, I'm confident of that, you know? Um, and uh, it could have been, it could have been life changing for that entire team. And instead it was like, we returned capital with a modest kind of multiple to our investors. And that's about it. Those are about the, the only people that made money on the deal. And I, I, some of it was based on execution, for sure. We'll take, take that. But most of it, I think, was based on sort of the structures that we stepped into, how we raised money, when we raised, how much we raised, the terms, the preferences, the lick preps, the participating preferred, like all the things that we did ultimately led to, you know, a, a, what I would say is like kind of a disappointing outcome as a founder. So that kind of created a, a little bit of a, a little bit of a taste in my mouth for VCs. Sure. Sure. And like the, the, the lick preferences, the participations, was that a function of like the risk that the VCs were coming in at or like, were you guys overcapitalized and spent too fast because the VCs push, <laughs> push the, the pedal to you? Both. Yeah, exactly. Both of those. I mean, those are two, two reasons that you just illustrated. I think you know another one was, another reason was, um, we didn't really understand, we didn't really understand sort of where we were, when we were raising, but we had a tremendous amount of momentum and excitement. I mean, we raised our seed round. We raised a two point eight million dollar seed round on basically like an idea. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this was in 20, was 2012, early 2012, I think. But, like, we raised... That's sizable for that. And, but it was cybersecurity, so at that time that was probably, like, you yeah. know, a little hotter. But, but it was literally nothing. I mean, it was, like, it was like the back of a napkin kind of idea. And we had, like, we had a really um, amazing, actually, uh, a, a, a incredible kind of uh, mathematician who was who was one of the kind of early... What wasn't really full time of the company wasn't a co-founder, but he was like the he was it was his math that we were productizing, and uh, you know he it, it, what he was doing was really unique and scalable, especially 
given the timing. It was the same year that McKinsey coined the term big data analytics. And it was when, you know, Amazon Web Services was like just starting to get, you know, real use for, for, for serious business cases. And so we figured out a way to parallelize all these algorithms that had never been able to been scaled. They were only like academically, um, you know, sort of postulated, but they couldn't scale until now. Mm -hmm. And so there was like a big idea here uh, that, that we were capitalizing on. And that's where I think we got the momentum to raise a lot of money at a significant pre-money. We got super far out in front of our skis, but like the greatest risk was technical and we never caught up with that technical risk. Like we built gen one of the product. I managed a team uh, where all the engineers were in Siberia and through a local contractor in, in Georgetown and kind of DC area. And it was like, it reminded me like I'd be on these calls and it was like those MasterCard commercials where the guy's like, oh, yes, this is Peggy. How may I help you? And, I'm like, <laughs> and it, was, it was like confusion, like things lost in translation. I remember we, said, we were talking about the, the, the engineer was, was saying, um, he was like, we are trying to do the pivot in a way. And I'm like, what is a pivot? Mm -hmm. Pivot? And it was like, and then finally somebody on the team is like, is he talking about the pivot? Like the pivot table? And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, pivot, yeah. Pivot. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, there was like, it's like always like, uh, you know, these, these like lost in translation kind of, it, it, was, it was really challenging. But like that whole version, that first version of the platform, nobody ever used it. Like not a single customer ever used it. It was like a year of development probably spent like 800, 900 grand and like never had a single user. And so like we burned a lot of money without any traction and then trying to catch up with our post money valuation of at that, at the seed, it was like the expectation was gonna meet, need to be that like we would be doing like two to 3 million in revenue just to catch up with that post money. And by the time we needed to raise again, we had like one or two pilots, no paying customers. So it was like, right. It was that was the eternal cycle that we 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 sort of started on. It's like behind behind our skis from the get go. Mm -hmm. And then you know then capital came in with licks and preferences, yep. and because of the risk. And then you know you're you're working your ass off, and at that point, yeah. you're like I'm out. Yeah. Well, the yeah. economics aren't there. Yeah, the economics aren't there. You know, there were some other things too, but yeah, that's of course. the whole. That's yeah. Of course, yeah. and so and then you decided to uh, to join the dark side. Uh, no, so the, the oh the CIA oh oh yeah. I, yeah. You're like the CIA. No, I was like no, no that was before. <laughs> that was before. Yeah. No, no, yeah, I, I, no, I did shadow ops side. before that. Yeah, the VC dark side. Yeah, so I I uh, it's funny. I actually it wasn't it wasn't that deliberate of a path. Um, I started so one of my other co-founders. Uh, it's funny. All three of us co-founders from from that company from Red Owl are all VCs now. Interestingly, um, but Rennie, Rennie McPherson and I, Guy stayed, Guy Filippelli stayed as the CEO. Rennie McPherson and I um, started a data science services company called The Twenty, and um, had had a great run there. Um, you know, it was it was really kind of a fun fun way to keep doing what we were doing and leveraging our network, um, and that gave me sort of the freedom and the ability to um, and the flexibility. Like before, remote work was a thing. That was a totally remote company, which was kind of cool. Um, but that gave me the ability to move to Montana in 2015. And when I got here, I really wanted something to anchor. I didn't just want to you know, continue running the 20 from Montana. Um, that seemed too strange or foreign to me, but I, you know, I could kind of keep that afloat nights and weekends uh, with, with Rennie, with my partner. Um, but I wanted something. I wanted to plug into this community and I wanted to do something that was like more aligned with my passion, which was like, you know, I would come home from these meetups in Baltimore and my wife was like, wow, you, you get more excited about like meeting founders and like mentoring and coaching and helping founders and um, than you do about your day job. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, my day job is like exhausting and like, being, mm -hmm. and, but like, I love, like it gives me energy to like help people and help these founders. And so I stumbled upon this, this job opening. It was like 48 hours before the, the rec closed. Um, and I applied to be the director of the Blackstone Launchpad at Montana State University and got an interview. And then like, you know, two months later, a month later, I was in Bozeman in January of 2015. Um, and so my mission and my passion at that point was like helping Montana founders start companies, raise money, um, 
raise money responsibly, do it the mm-hmm. right way, you know. And, and th- that just happened to be the same year and kind of the same time horizon as Next Frontier Capital's first fund. Fund one was uh, 2015 vintage. So you've got, and then even, you know, some of the, some of the portfolio companies in fund one, uh, one in particular that I worked really closely with um, when I was at, in the Blackstone launch pad at MSU. So, you know, it's, it was kind of that fun, it was like right place, right time, ecosystem. And basically my job through that, that role was to just meet people and network across the state and also to leverage network and resources in our ecosystem. So I spent a lot of time in Colorado. I spent a lot of time in um, like what kind of Boulder area, Denver area, but I was trying to take best practices from Techstars and Boomtown and bring them to Montana. Um, and so that was, that was kind of how that journey began. And then I got really close with the team at Next Frontier Capital through just some, some professional stuff and personal stuff that we were working on. And when the team raised fund two in the fall of 2017, they basically said, hey, we're looking for a junior partner to join the team. Um, the job description was kind of like uh, partner, also, you know, janitor, right. uh, everything else, analyst, yeah, mm-hmm. you name it, like the full spectrum. But it was like a super cool opportunity for me. And I was basically like, I'll do anything. Like, this is an incredible opportunity to do, to work with great people, to work with founders in our ecosystem, um, and uh, like learn how to do venture right. Like that, that was what I saw this as an opportunity to do, especially because of the reputation and the brand of our firm. And so that's kind of like, I think a daily crusade for me is like continuing to be the VC, not, ju- not just the VC that's like, oh, we're founder friendly and we, uh, you know, like, no, be that, mm-hmm. live that, mm-hmm. like earn it earn it every day and that's that's kind of like my mantra with founders and with with the ecosystem what does it mean to you to be founder friendly yeah so i think i think it means like number one being like being fully transparent about what is going on in a process especially uh especially for founders that have never raised money before like helping them understand exactly how i'm gonna get to an investment decision how I'm gonna get, and, it, and, and not just me, but the firm, right? So it's like, what is our process? How long is it gonna take? What do we need from, from the founder? And what do we need to get to an investment decision? I mean, that's, that's kind of like the basics, but, but other than that, it's like that level of transparency and trust, I think becomes, it's like the foundation of a relationship of trust that lasts beyond the investment. And in some cases it's funny because it lasts beyond the pass. Like if a founder is clear what I need to see and they provide me with the info and I get to a no, I'm gonna have, an, I'm gonna have a 30 minute call with that founder and say, here's why we got to a no. Like I was excited enough to say, I'm starting diligence with you. Here's where we got to and here's why we're saying no. And you know, I, it's funny, I cannot believe how often I get feedback from founders like, wow, you're the first BC that's ever done that. Like usually they just ghost me. Usually they just say no in, in like an email and, and no reason, like, but to follow up. And it's funny because I've seen probably three or four examples of this. People I've developed just trust with that have now become not only a referral source for other deals that we have done, but when those opportunities come back around and the founder is either raising a follow on round or something, if it's still in our thesis and in, in, in their honor bullseye, you know, it's like I'm the first person they come to because we have that trust. And so it, it's like, I, I, I just think it's, 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 it's an optimum strategy that sadly, uh, whether it's just time or attention, like I don't think it's that common. Mm-mm. No, it's not. It's not because I mean, in the trans- if we're in a transaction business, like sitting back and retreading and spending time with people that you're not going to transact with to most would seem like a waste of time right but you know goodwill goes a long way and it doesn't doesn't cost a ton to be nice right and to be courteous exactly Exactly. and and that's the other thing too is like i think the biggest the biggest kind of rule rule of thumb for me is like kind of the 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 will rogers uh you know saying of like you got to like step into somebody's shoes and, and walk around at them um and and like that approach of like I, th- I think it was, I don't know why I'm like quoting Will Rogers today, but 
Yeah. Who, who, the, who the fuck is Will Rogers? <laughs> oh, you got to look it up. All right, if you're listening I'm to the just, podcast. I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> so Will, Will Rogers had this, like, mantra of, like, I never met a man I didn't like. And, like, in today's world, okay, like, we can replace man with, like, person, okay? But, but that's mm-hmm. the quote. Um, but it's, like, I approach every founder, like, as if, like, I like you. I like you, and I want to get to know you, and I want this relationship to, I want to give this relationship a chance and treating people that way like for me because I I think that's like the basis of being uh, you know just being fair and being being a human being it's like I want to give everybody a chance until you prove me otherwise whether it's like ah, this business doesn't work or whether it's like wow you're a jerk I tried but like that's how I approach it and and like because that's that's the how that's the way I would want to be treated and that's that's the way like when I was a founder like I I remember and I empathize with like how much it sucked when I wasn't treated that way. And so that's, I don't know, that's just, that's my approach. Yeah. Well done, man. Well done. And so just to go do a little bit of inside baseball, kind of on your fund stuff, you said the first, first fund was 36 million? First fund was 20. Second was 38. 38. So, and there were 16 deals out of 38? Yep. And you had a, and you were, how many checks were you writing? How many, how many, like how big a checks were you writing for those? Uh, so I think fund two, we were av- our average is like around one and a half for some of the lead deals, like one and a half to two million. Um, and then, you know, one of the things about being a regional VC, it's funny, like some people will say like, oh, there's adverse selection. Like you're only, you're only looking at the best deals in Montana. Like how good can mm-hmm. that strategy be? And, you know, it's interesting. That actually was the fund one strategy, Montana sure. only. You talk about like regional selectivity, right. right? But but the reality is it's like there's there's other folks that don't even look in this region because it's like they're inundated with coastal deal flow and it's like, oh, how are you going to grow a team there or whatever? But what you find is that there are tremendous opportunities because people, you know, people may overlook this region and um, they have the same growth and same scale potential as, as other places. But the, one of the challenges is that like the, the statistics also don't lie. If you look at how undercapitalized Rocky Mountain companies are at the seed and Series A stage, it's like statistically significant uh, that how undercapitalized they are. Just from even from like a, a median round size protect perspective at the seed and Series A. And so what that means is these founders have to uh, they have to get further because then once you get to a growth stage round, it's like. You, you, you're either in the big leagues or you're not. Like it's the same hurdles, the same milestones. So you either have to get there on less capital, which means you're scrappier and you're, you know, and, and that's, some people do that, or you need an alternative source of capital. You need someone to fill that void. And that's kind of, a, that's our strategy. It's like doing these tweener rounds, C plus to series A stage, series A to series B tweeners. Um, to help get these the best companies sufficiently capitalized to get to those coastal growth rounds. And what's fascinating about that, you, you typically get this price compression in, you know, in the region at the seed in Series A. But if you, once again, the data doesn't lie. At the Series B, there's actually a price, there's like an, not only an expansion, but it's, it's higher median pre-monies and larger round sizes for regional companies um, than, than coastal firms at the Series B. And I think it's like, well, why the heck is that happening? And I actually think one of the reasons why that happens is because there's more, there's, there's more scarcity for those type of companies in region. And so you have to, the coastal firms have to compete even harder to win those, those opportunities outside of their typical backyard regions. So <laughs> there's good reasons to, to both do what we do from an investment strategy perspective, but it's also necessary in a lot of cases for these founders. So we, we, may, we also maintain a pretty big reserve ratio as a result of that strategy as well. Got it. Um, that's incredible. That, that really is um, an incredible story. There's kind of a lot for me to kind of think about when you unpack that. I mean, when I think about regional too versus being national, let's just say like, just exclude the coast, just national. Like for me, like we're national excluding Silicon Valley and, and you know, New York and Boston and Austin and the main markets. But we have a pretty, you know, national focus. I mean, we pick core markets, but um, when I see a deal that is also 
in a market that I've never been, let's just say it's Pittsburgh, right? And it's not been, you know, funded super heavily and it appears really good. I'm, I'm wondering why, right? Yeah, right <laughs> you know, like, right. am I, am I the only, why am I running to kiss the, the ugly girl? And like, I don't know it, right? And when you are regional, you've seen that company over time. Exactly. And that means a lot. Yeah. Well, and that's that's the way, like once again, that also gets back to the relationship strategy, right? Like it's like when you know the people and you believe in the people and you follow the people, like there's a different level of, of you know, just visibility that you have on the actual trajectory versus like what you get in a 30 minute pitch the first time you meet somebody when they're, you know, when they're raising a series A or something, so. Um, I, you know, I, I think too, the other thing that, that shocks people, like Montana is, be, that's where we started, but it's also like a super interesting anecdote uh, in terms of the potential in underserved geographies. So I love this stat, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it out there because I love this. So between 1995 to 2015, there were 200, according to PitchBook, the source of all great data, so 95 to 2014, 20 year time frame basically, there was $223 million invested in the state of Montana at the VC, early stage VC. Laughable, right? I mean, like that puts Montana like either at 50 or 51 in the United States if you include Puerto Rico on mm -hmm. an annual basis in terms of access to capital, right? Our firm started in 2015, and this is not all because of us, but you know, the, the data is the data. Since 2015, 2015 to 2022, there's been $1.05 billion invested in the state. So that's an 11, basically annualized, that's like an 11X annual increase. We, so we've invested in, I said 48 companies total across all three funds. 24 of those, believe it or not, have a Montana presence or Montana operating presence of some kind. And those, just the Montana companies alone, have raised 47 rounds of financing. So obviously 24 of those rounds are like us leading or mm -hmm. first investment, but 47 total rounds, 314 million total capital paid in, and that's about a leverage of like, for what we wrote, that's $6.40 paid into our portco for every dollar we've invested. And of those 24, we've had nine breakouts, that's four exits and five growth stage companies. And, and frankly, the reason why it's like, oh, nine of 24, did the rest die? No, all of them are still alive, but for two. So 22, so that's another 11 that are still like on the path to breaking out, I would argue. Mm -hmm. That's phenomenal, man. Yeah, but that's just Montana, right? I mean, we're not talking about Idaho, Wyoming, which we've made investments in both of those states. We're not talking about Arizona. We're not talking about Nevada. Like, I, I believe some of the climates in these states are pretty similar, similar story and similar opportunity that's been overlooked for like decades. decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Les, it's been awesome to have you on the show. Couple quick canned questions. What's your favorite book? Uh, favorite book is The Three Body Problem. Uh, sci-fi, I'm a sci-fi fan. It's, it's like a mind blower. I, I read it uh, about a year ago. I went through the whole, the whole series and uh, I'm probably gonna read it again because it's like it's like a religious experience. It's wild. What's it about? Uh, so it's about a an incident that happens uh, at like a it's it's like a Chinese RF collection facility, and it's like an incident that happens where somebody sends a signal out into the galaxy, uh, and as basically to say like we're here, and they get. Uh, I don't want to spoil it, but like of course they send the signal out and they get they get a signal back and that's it transpires from there. Is that the book? Is that the books where like you know the U.S. has like a hundred years to prepare for an alien invasion or yes, something? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There was actually somebody else on the, on the show that says that read that book and said it was incredible. It's such a mind bend on the concepts of time, space, uh, like purpose for being um, it explores like end of the world it explores like future of the next world it explores tech innovate uh, it's 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 incredible incredible book and there's a it's a three book series uh three body problems the first book then it's uh the dark forest and then death's end i think it's the third book so you said one book but all three of them actually the dark forest is the best of the series second okay okay 
Uh, best piece of business advice you've ever gotten? Uh, ooh, earn it. Just er earning it every day. Like nobody, nobody is made. Like you have to earn it every day. Awesome. I love it. Everybody, thank you for tuning in to the Capital Stack. We talk to entrepreneurs, founders, and investors about all things value creation. We are on all platforms, Spotify, YouTube, uh, what's the other one? Apple. So we drop a, an episode every Tuesday. Please like, subscribe, cancel me, do whatever you need to do. And I will talk to you next week. See you. Bye-bye.